Hey guys, uh, I am Tyler Posey, and I am going to be sharing a personal uh, story of, of mine with mental health and just kind of dealing with awkward silences um, and friends helping me out through it. Almost three years ago, uh, I lost my mother to breast cancer. She was just there for me more than anybody, and I would go to her for everything. And then when she died, I kind of, I, I felt like I didn't really have anybody to go to. I think humans need to break down and cry every now and then, and I, would do that with my mom, and then after after she died, I felt like I had no one to do that around. You know, my friends, you know, I gotta be tough in front of my friends, in front of my brothers, in front of my dad. I would go to work, and then I would go home. There were a bunch of times where my, my, my best friends would, would hit me up, and if I, you know, wasn't looking so well or doing so well, they, they would bring it up and be like, hey man, are you okay, what's going on? I'd be like, yeah, I'm okay. I wouldn't really get into it. And I realized that, you know, that didn't make me feel any better. When I get depressed, I feel like I'm a burden on people, and I don't, I don't want to burden them with my problems. And so once I got over that, I was able to open up more with them, and you know, we just have these great deep conversations now whenever we're feeling sad. I even have a tattoo. It's a tattoo of two hands shaking like this, and it has a lot of different meanings, but to me it means literally to reach out to my buddies when I'm in need of them. If you know somebody well enough, it's kind of easy to tell if something's a little off. One of my buddies just recently, um, has been going through some stuff. Whenever I would have a party, he, I could just, he would kind of isolate himself in, in the back and just kind of, uh, I could tell that he was down. Sometimes I, tr I try to um, let him come to me first and, and see if he wants to, uh, you know, ask for help or say, hey man, I'm kind of low right now. Um, but if he doesn't, I'll usually reach out to him. It's always kind of awkward to start that conversation. Um, but now I think we've gotten comfortable enough with it and, and I, I've seen the good that it does. So I, I try to get rid of that awkward feeling and just kind of go right for it. It's easy to forget that reaching out to your friends really kind of almost immediately makes things better. Therapy is something that I discovered a few years ago, then I started doing it a lot, and, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of therapy. I kind of use myself as an example. I say, hey man, I've been to therapy and it, you know, it works, and just talking your, your, your feelings out, getting everything off your chest, that's therapy in itself. If you recognize that a buddy is kind of struggling, or you yourself are, I know how hard it is to, to reach out for your own reasons. I had my own reasons why it was hard. Just do it. Um, it, it is kind of an awkward situation and not the most natural, but I think we have to get over that and make it a really natural situation. So just do it. Just, just um, kind of face your fears and ask somebody. It'll save a life. Save mine. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Therapeutic Conversation Show. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Jones, LPC in the house. Welcome, welcome, welcome to my show. I have a special guest today, and we're going to be talking about African-American men in therapy. We're going to be sharing and, and, and talking about some things. We have an interesting person in the person of Dr. Alvin Sutherland, Jr. That's right. Welcome, Dr. Sutherland. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, I'm well. Good, I'm so appreciate glad. It, appreciate it. So glad that you are part of this wonderful show, the Therapeutic Conversation Show. And so Dr. Sutherland, I just want to give a little bit of insight, and I know he can introduce his own self, but um, he is here in the Atlanta area. He is a licensed professional counselor, educator, uh, school counselor, uh, and also workshop facilitator, entrepreneur, and have, and he is the owner of the Sutherland Center. Is that correct? That's that And look at him, and he wearing his his logo. <laughs> logo and showing stuff and trying to educate me on wearing mine. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, welcome to the Therapeutic Conversation Show. I appreciate it. Appreciate I'm so glad that you're here today, and we've talked. I'm telling you, you know. And then it's just so interesting, though, you all out there, is that. When you meet somebody who's doing something, you know, very similar things that you're doing, um, and just to see a, another brother, right, right. Uh, you know, doing his thing in mental health right. and also counseling and just helping people. So he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, what he does and um, and he does community based uh, counseling. And, and that's a whole nother realm. And a lot of times um, a lot of us go to the uh you know, people come into the office to see, uh, you know, to get therapy. But he does, he goes to the homes and all of those type of things. So we're going to be talking all about that. So please reach out today. Um, definitely, you can definitely call us at 678-528-9482. That's 678-528-9482. Or you can send us a message on Facebook. 
Um, first, we have, oh, we have Sherry Taylor. Thank you. God works through others to give the help that we need. Thank you, right. Sherry, for, for that shout out, because that is definitely the truth, that God is at work in all of us to give us the help that we need. And I also like that, too, because, you know, God. That's that, that's that Proverbs eleven fourteen. All right, man. We go, and then, look, he she comes some, some the word up in here, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's very clear so about that. And also, I want to focus, too, with uh, you. You know, dealing with the family. I know I've looked at your website and your father and and husband and everything, and you and you really are an advocate about the family. So we're going to be talking all about that today. Sure. All right. So let's go ahead and jump right in, Dr. Sutherland. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you want the people to know, and then we'll jump into this hot topic because you know, in my opinion, that you're going to you know we already talked about this earlier. In my opinion, I think it's difficult to get African American males in therapy, and I do see a lot of that in my practice, but it is very difficult at times to get African-American males in therapy, but he, he has a different thought, a different, you know, hypothesis, a thought about it, thesis about it, whatever you want to call it, and so, yeah, philosophy, that's the word I was trying to get in my head this morning, early this morning, but anyway, that's what we're going to, you know, be talking about, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Like you said, I'm Dr. Alvin Sutherland, Jr. I own a company called the Sutherland Center. We provide in-home therapy in, well, actually just hit the 12th county, just made it down to Troop County. So I've been doing this since 2007. I come into your home, sit down on your sofa with you, sit down and you're at your table with you, and we have conversations about what we can do to strengthen the foundation for your families. I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm a father myself, a husband myself, mm -hmm. and everything that I do with my clientele, I do in my own home. So I'm not going to sit there and have a conversation with you about what you're doing to strengthen your relationships, and then I'm going to neglect my own. Even with my supervisees and those that come to my workshop, we specifically mm -hmm. talk about making those connections in your own home and yes. applying those techniques, interventions, strategies that you want to call them in the field of counseling. In your own home, folks. yes, and then you go out and you share with your clientele. Yes, how they can strengthen their families as well. I enjoy it. Good. I do clinical supervision and consultation as well here in Georgia. Also, a facilitator of a ethics workshop, which the next one's going to be on March the sixteenth for mental health professionals. Wow, well, so you're doing some big things right there. Yeah. So, so let's just go. You know, a little bit. You know, let's just really dive into this to this family, uh, you know, support and how important it is that we also, you know, bring therapy to the home. I think that that is just, just brilliant. As yeah. I said, when I first met you, brilliant. And this is how it came out. Yeah. When how I, did it come about? That's mom, what I was going to yeah, ask. Yeah, you yeah. go right ahead. <laughs> when I told my mom, you know, I started my company in 2007. When I told my mom what I was going to do, that I wanted to make house calls. Uh -huh. She told me that a long, 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 long time ago that doctors used to make house calls. And yes. they come into the home with a black bag and they come and treat the clients. Exactly. The house. But I come into the home, I have a black notebook. So when you <laughs> see me, I'm in that notebook, I'm coming to the home. And it was just, just a way to bring the service to the people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people's schedules are so full that they're not able to always make it into the office. Exactly. I want to alleviate the resistance to seeking wise counsel. Mm -hmm. I come to you, I've served every county in the Metro Atlanta area, Fulton, as far as Cartersville, Gwinnett, Fayetteville, Carrollton, DeKalb, Douglas, Paulding, Cobb, Fayetteville, Clayton, a whole bunch of counties. Those are all the counties in Georgia. All, all in Metro Atlanta. Yeah, the area. Metro counties. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of counties. And just added Troop County last couple of weeks ago. So that makes the 12th county that I've been into. And I, I've seen over 500 families from oh, wow. parents to their children. My clientele's age, youngest is six, yeah. elementary age, middle school age, high school age, yeah. college age, and enjoy it. Wow, and that's, you know, I mean, that's awesome. I enjoy awesome. my time, too. And my, the time that I do for my own part of self-care, me and my wife, we play tennis together. I'm okay. On the tennis team. All right, I now. I ride my motorcycle. All right, so he even yeah. talking about self-care, you all. We like, talk about know. that on the show all the time. Right, right. But, okay, so, so... How do you find the clientele to, I mean, do you mass advertise? Do you, I mean, how do people find you? Right. Because you said you don't have an, a, a per se office. I, office. I came and even showed him my office downstairs. He was like, oh, that's an office. Cool. But, he, cool. yeah, but he said he don't do offices like that. So, so, so tell me, how do you find well, clients? Majority of the people find, I've been in, in education for mm -hmm. since 2002. 
And my first several clients were actually teachers, families that I used to work oh, with. Oh, wow. That's how you started so it. Okay. I'm on the referral list for school systems. I'm on the referral list for a lot of hospitals. People can find me on psychologytoday.com. Okay. I've been in Newsweek magazine before. I was on Real Housewives of Atlanta. I did a session with Miss Burris and her mother back in 2014. That was season six, episode 21. All right. Now, y'all got to look that up. Look, we got a superstar in this. <laughs> I'm just and joking. I got Go some ahead. stuff on BET on the Frankie and Nephew show in 2015 as well. But yeah. A lot of times, it's just word of mouth. If, when you provide a quality service, people will share. All I right. I love that. Re repeat customers and yeah. repeat clientele. I've actually served almost everybody okay. in the family before, from the uncles, the grandmothers, and it's they just share. Uh -huh. They share, and you provide a quality service. Then you network with other mental health professionals. And, it's exactly. And it, and it works that way, and it, I enjoy it. Good, and I can tell, and I mean, and that's what I appreciate about you just kind of meeting you is that the, you, you have that passion for, you know, for that. And a lot of people, you know, I mean, I come from the chaplaincy world in, in hospice especially, and we had to go out to the... Um, house because the purpose of hospice is to definitely provide that support at the end of life. And so I came in as a chaplain role and helping them with their spiritual needs and counseling and things like that. Um, and also, you know, helping them in the transition process, either grief and loss or, yep. the, or the patient transitioning. So I'm very familiar with going into homes, but I just never thought about it just in basic counseling. But you're right, it's very effective, right. you know, because people feel comfortable right. when you go in. I mean, they're in there home setting right. you know it's not even just always in the home i've had some clientele say doc we're gonna meet at the park today okay we'll so in the community the yeah we'll meet at the park they want to get their exercise so we'll walk i told them i can't guarantee your privacy and confidentiality and we're walking and having engaging in conversation and people ain't paying attention that you what you're doing you're doing therapy right there mm -hmm. Nobody paying attention they do they did whatever they need to do. And it's just meeting people where they are. That's the yes, that's what I like. Is that people say in the mental health field, meeting people where they are. And I bring the service to the people wherever. I they love are. it. And that's and I and I think that also speaks to church. Right. <laughs> you know, that we have to meet people where they are, and then we also have to bring service to where people are. You know, it's not just in the four walls all the time. It is community based and mm -hmm and reaching out, and I think that those things are very vital. Now, what is your experience with African-American males in therapy? Of course, this is my premise, and y'all have heard me say it before, that when I took the national teaching test, I don't know whether yo, that question came up for you, but it was like, who was less likely to get therapy? And the, the answer was definitely African-Americans and African-American males especially um, in that test. And I'm not saying the test is right or wrong, I'm just saying, but it is by my experience that it's, you know, it's very difficult uh, to get males. I mean, not that I see an increase since I've been in practice, but it's still very difficult. A lot of times, in my experience, a lot of African-American males wait until there's a crisis, you know, and even going to the doctor, we wait till we got to go to the emergency room before we would get preventative maintenance, um, you know, and checks and, and, and things, uh, you know, dealing with our, our physical health. So the mental health is like definitely on the back burner, you know, in my experience. But what is your experience in de definitely being an African-American male or black male? What is your experience in that? I mean, you know, everything that's psychological is biological and everything that's biological is psychological. It's not uncommon that people will wait till they have, they stomp their toe or they twist their ankle to go to the medical doctor. Uh -huh. Usually you got to notice something going on before you're going to seek wise counsel. Okay. And there's really nothing wrong with that. From my perspective in the almost, what, 2007 since I've been in my company, but I've been 20 mm -hmm. years in the field, I got a lot of black men. Mm -hmm. A lot of black men from the fathers who were involved in the want to reestablish relationship with their children, from parents who are co-parenting, the dad lives one area and the mom lives other way, and they're co-parenting their children. A lot of times, it is the man who's calling me to seek out the wise counsel. For oh, in your experience, yeah. In my, well, that's in my a switch, and I know a lot of people talking about. You know, yes, that's a huge guys, switch. You know, not from my perspective, is I've had over five hundred families that I've served, and in those five hundred families, I would probably say three hundred and fifty have a man involved in therapy as well. Wow. The ones that are not usually the, the father has been deceased or the father lives in another state and will 
bring him in somehow when he comes in time. We have a lot of men who are truck drivers and on the road. Yeah. But I have a lot of dads who are still part of it, from dads who are former football players, dads who are lawyers, dads who are judges. Wow. And my clientele range the gambit of professions. Mm -hmm. and, and always, even if the dad initially starts not in, Okay. It's always an option. Feel free to bring your dad in any time we want to prepare for him. He'll be involved in the process. And when I get a chance to sit down with the dad, I always get a session with the dad. Okay. Or the stepdad or the uncle. And they don't try to run dad. off and, and, and be resistant uh, at all? You ever heard of You fish? Yeah. You lure. Oh, okay. You so put a, you put a good bait out there. And you're building that relationship. Right. You know, a lot of people say, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Mm -hmm. And that's a myth as well. If you put enough salt on their food, they're going to be thirsty. And wow. they're going to drink. And with service that we provide is to get people to understand how important it is to be connected to your family, mm. to strengthen the foundation of your family. From my perspective, the stronger that the family unit is, yeah. it's going to impact that city, yes. that community, that state, and your nation. Yes. And, and a lot of times, it's just sometimes the things are set up, or the systems that they call it, are set up to push the dads out, or yes. to push the men out. And we pull them back in and we encourage the men to push into the lives of their children, mm. push into the lives of their family. As the kids are growing up, they want to kind of go their own way. Of course. And we encourage them to push into their lives, even as they're trying to pull away to whatever the values, morals, beliefs, the philosophy that you want for your family, for your children, you teach it. Yeah, you yes. You teach it to them. Yeah. But from my perspective, I got a lot of men. Wow. So do you do parenting skills yes. and things like that right. in your therapy? To, right. Because, I mean, you know, as I told you know, to people all the time, my clients, it, it's no map for, you know, or book, a manual for raising children. I mean, some things you learn, Actually, some things is. you, oh, there is a manual? Yeah. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Okay, yeah, say more word, about word, that. I mean, the word, <laughs> if you believe in the word, the word is another resource. Like, you can go to a Barnes & Nobles or Amazon, mm -hmm. you can get a book on parenting. A lot of parenting books will reference the word of God. Yeah. And yeah. it has it has things that you that are more effective. If you get away from good and bad and right or wrong, okay. there are things that are more efficient and effective for raising yeah. children. Like, for example, being a part of their life. Being committed and involved and responsible in their life, being gotcha. emotionally, physically, and spiritually present. Mm -hmm. Over, hey, here, let me give you a computer. Let me give you an iPad. Let me give you a, a let me give you a video game. And you go over there because my dissertation was about the effects of father absence on delinquent behavior of African American men. All right, say that again. You said that too fast. They didn't the get it. The effects of father <laughs> absence on delinquent behavior of African American men. And wow. What I was looking at. Fathers who That's what he did his doctorate in. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, his this dissertation like for his doctorate. The fathers who were emotionally absent, physically absent, are a combination of both. Wow. The fathers who are emotionally absent causes more trauma for the children. Yes. Meaning, meaning you come home. A kid go in the room, play his game, and you just sit down and watch TV. And there's no emotional connection. That causes more problems for the children. Exactly. It's better if they never knew you. Exactly. And then everybody just kept you alive through telling stories. You know, your You're dad definitely is so on that. And you remind me just of your dad. He would be so proud of you. That would, does more for a kid than they see you every day, and y'all have no relationship. Wow. And that's what we do. That's what your that research showed. Yeah, and it's, it, it's, it's about getting the family to reconnect and to connect again. And the simplicity of it is sitting at the table. Yes. And you have families who are engaged in everything that ever significant happened in life took place at a table from allegedly Jesus or if you believe Jesus mm -hmm. in the last summer they were at yeah. a table. The Declaration of Independence would take place at a table. Yeah. Board meetings happen at a table. Mm -hmm. People come together and write Congress laws at a table. And exactly. what are we doing right now? Yeah. We're sitting at a table. Sitting at a table. And so there's something where, about a table, right, huh? This is where the dads can instill what he want the people to know, what mm. he want his family to know. Wow. And they can share in what they call table topics, which is like a Toastmaster term. Mm -hmm. And they'll begin to engage in conversations together of how they can strengthen the foundation for the family. Wow. That, I mean, that is true. And But the only thing I was saying, you know, I was saying a few minutes ago is that, you know, there are, you know, nobody's perfect. And, you know, parents do things well. And then sometimes parents, you know, do things that are not well, you know, even as they're growing is what I was saying. Mm -hmm. So I think everything is a process. You sure, know, I don't sure. think there's a perfect parent. And just because you come from a household of, of, of even two parents doesn't mean that you're going to just be okay all the time. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people come from, you know, households that are, you know, with two parents and working and educated, right. but yet they, as you said, turn, you know, they go in a 
in another path, right. you know, sometimes. So there's no guarantee is what I was saying. But we do try to do the best that we can do and get educated on being the best parents that we can be. You just said it right. <laughs> from my perspective, that's, the, that's the missing link. That's what we, yeah. So we're on the same page. We talk about get educated. Right. And the responsibility of parents, if you didn't know, is to prepare your children to live independently. Yeah. Alone. And whatever you want them to know by the time they hit 18, in the state of Georgia, at 18, you're looking at an adult. If yes. you go to war, mm-hmm. you carry a gun. Yeah. You know, whatever you want them to know, whether you want us to know how to tie a tie, how uh-huh. to shake a hand, how to cook a meal, mm-hmm. how to fold do clothes, whatever you want them to know in preparation for adulthood, yeah. you teach them. Yes. And so and so we're focusing, you know, definitely on that. So for, for people that are just joining, this is the Therapeutic Conversation Show. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Jones, LPC. I'm here with Dr. Sutherland, Sutherland, and he is here from the Sutherland Center talking about, you know, his work in the community and in therapy, working with the family, and especially concentrating on the African-American male, but really that family unit. And we've been definitely talking about that today. Um, and I did pose the question about, about about why African American males don't seek therapy, uh, Dr. Sutherland and his research. Let me say it that way is saying you know, and his experience is yeah. showing us that there's hope, yeah. you know, and that you know we don't have to give up, you know, because a lot of times we have given up. Now, what would you say is since you're a spiritual man, what would you say to these? pastors, especially these male pastors that do not see the need for mental health? I can't speak until it's <laughs> all, but I do have clients who are pastors. Okay, I do I've too. Had, right, I got pastors <laughs> who come in and they dialogue about sometimes they don't have anyone else to talk uh-huh. to. Because and pastors. females too, I'm not excluding the females, I'm yeah, just focusing male, on the males. Male yeah, uh uh-huh. Yeah, who, who I see as well. And they seek in their own wild count. They don't always want their congregation to know. Mm-hmm. Or they want other people to know because they are on this level. <laughs> and they don't want everybody to know that they're having some difficulties in their own And life. challenges, yeah. Right? Yeah, the difficult they have. And they do seek. Yeah. Now, I don't know how about all of them seeking. I know <laughs> a pastor who he mentors other pastors. Okay, that is got a part you. Of one of the things that he does, he has several pastors that he's mentoring and he meets with them regularly. Okay, good. To support them. Like, yeah. So I can't speak and tell you about All right, right. well, you know, that's, that's my, my field. My, <laughs> right, so you know more. <laughs> but I just wanted to see what you were going to say because you, you know, you quoted the Bible over there and I was like, uh oh, you getting on it. <laughs> it's a resource. Yes, it's of a course, resource. of course. Right. I mean, and definitely we're talking about, you know, the word and, you know, and definitely this is one way praise where we're we voicing the gospel. Right. So we definitely are definitely, you know, about that um, too. So there is, you know, definitely. But I mean, but everything is a process, is what I'm saying. And and what would you say to some of the single mothers that are holding it down the best way they can with their, especially their um their male, you know, children. Their, you know, that they're, you know, that. I mean, what do you say about that? Because there are some, you know, there are some fathers that are just absentee. They got their own mental health issues, their own challenges. They don't want any parts of it. I mean, I see a lot of them in in my practice. And, you know, and I even tell people it's nothing always magical either about um, how they come in. Some of them just seek an African-American male just to be seen in therapy because they, you know, they need that that mentorship, but they also need the counseling and then also work with them to be um, effective in their parenting. So what do you say out there to the single mothers that are holding things down? What would you say is this? We're still about the talking about the family, right. Dr. Sutherland. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I applaud you. I high five you. I <laughs> greet you with a, with a warm hug for the work that you're doing. Yeah. You're still impactful. And mothers don't always have to think they got to do the role of the mother and the father. The, you're a woman and you're the mother. You do exactly what you feel you should do as a mother. Mm. If you believe you're, what you're going to do for your children is to teach your son how to tie a tie, then fine. That's great. Whatever you want your children to know as they transition to adulthood, whatever you want to instill in them, responsibility is a skill that must be taught. And whatever you want to pour into your children, you do it. Mm. Regardless of you have the support or you don't have the support. It'd be great when you have the support from the uh, from the children's parent, the other parent, but you do the best that you can do, and you honor that, and your children will see your diligence, and they'll see your commitment in however you want to portray them. Yes, because we model 
and we can only imitate what we see every day. And the children will see your diligence and they're going to learn from that. Yes. If you're able to get other men to push into your children's life, whether through extracurricular activities mm -hmm. or teaching sports school, and other things, or uh, some of uh, the men in the church, however you want to get it done, I think a lot of those was it the 100,000 black men, mm -hmm. and all those different organizations they have, however you want to do it. But even if they're not, you do what you can do. Yes. I'm the product of that. My mom grew up with all women. And yeah. my mother did exactly what she felt she needed to do at that time to make me who I yes. am today. Yes. And I appreciate her. My mom is also Dr. Sutherland. Oh, wow. Yeah, she all has right a doctorate in pastoral counseling. Oh, my. All right, right now. We, all we, right we now. We attended Argosy and Sarasota together. We had class. What? Together, man. I don't know if you ever had class with your mom. No, no. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> man, I'm like, mama, dad, I had what? class with my mama. And she did what she did. You had Education. class with your mom? Yes. Yeah. Both of y'all were in the doctoral program? Yeah, she got a year behind I did, behind me. What? But it's it's education is big. Awesome. In our family. That's She's awesome. Preaching, educate, education and family. Education and family. Education and family. So that's where you that's where, that's where you get that from. It's the family unit. The whole yeah. unit. if you want to think of what modality I use, it's yeah. family system. Yes, it's family strict. system. There's no individual that's causing the difficulty that the family mm -hmm. experiences. It's the family that needs to be restructured and refocused on strengthening that foundation. Yes, and Never even their roles in the family. Um, and, and then I like Virginia Satir, and she talks about their different roles in that family. Everybody right. plays a different role, but it's a unit, and and we, and even community, too. Everybody kind of plays a different role. So I just think that, you know, I'm agreeing with you with those mentorships are very vital because I was even raised, I was raised by my aunt, my mother, too, but, but, but physically by my aunt, my mom's sister, and she instilled, you know, the church for me and my development you know the males especially two and females but the you know the males in the church kind of took me under their wing right. and was like you know they were like Brian you're not gonna go down this road you're not gonna go you know and that they spoke into my life and I don't want to start calling the names and get a little emotional because some of them are no longer in this experience um but you know, they spoke into my life, my uncle and just my my uncles and just my family, but then also the church community. They really were like, no, 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 no. You know, they would take me on trips and, and you know, certain things and really instilled in me, uh-uh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, beyond what my aunt, you know, could do, which she did an excellent job, I think. Yes. But I'm the, And my mother, shouts out to you. I know you're watching, so I love you. Um, but, you know, those type of things and just speaking those words and I think that's important too and that's what I try to also instill and teach in my practice especially with you know with the mothers you know still speak some positive things to your mm -hmm. children too because a lot of times everything is so negative of what right. they're not doing or how they're not performing but also we do need to balance that out with something that's positive about what they do yes before. yes and right. reinforcing those things and also setting those expectations not right. yelling and screaming and cussing them out all the time but also you know speaking those positive things and that I see these things in you and I know you can do it and that's what helped me, you know, to be a better person, to be who I am today. So I'm very yeah. grateful and thankful shout for all of those. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And my yeah. mom is watching. My aunt is no longer here in this experience. But my mother, I, I know she watch, you know, she's watching, and she really supports this program, too, and everything yeah. like that. So shouts out to you, Mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, and so I always tell people I had two moms. I mean, I was thankful, you know, and I had a father. It's a whole nother show, another conversation. Conversation, right. but um, but I'm thankful, and he's no longer, you know, in this experience too. But uh, but you know, but my my mother and my aunt, they really, you know, in their own way, I had the best of both worlds because they were really, you know, speaking those positive things and and also told me things that I could do. You know, they they allowed me to dream, to 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 visualize. They never said, well, you can't do this, you can't. They were like, Brian, you can do whatever you want to do, you know? So they spoke those things. So I think those things are very vital. Yes. So so in your experience, um, you know, so you're going to be doing a workshop. Let's talk about your workshop so we can definitely, if you're in the Atlanta area, definitely reach out. Or and anywhere in the world you want to come, you can still oh, come. Oh, just show up. Just show up. What's just the name register. of your workshop? And you said yeah. ethics? What the name of say? the workshop is called Struggle No More, A Counselor's Ethical Connection in Counseling. Okay. And what I'm doing is sharing with what happens was my wife, who's also a licensed professional counselor Okay, well, she is. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we kept hearing over and over again how 
some mental health professionals or mind health professionals were struggling in the work of how to help clients grow or okay. how to enhance their life. Okay. So for the last four to five years, we kept hearing that same phrase, I'm struggling with this, or mm. some of my supervisees or students when I used to teach at RUC, well, I'm struggling, I'm not sure. And we kept hearing the word, I'm struggling. Struggling, struggling okay. And that kind of where the title came from of struggling, and ideally, we're going to give some practical things that I do in my own household okay. and with my clientele. That way you won't struggle when you're with your clientele. Wow. And it's just like talking about the table and the yeah. significance of the table. And that is a therapeutic technique of sitting at the table. Yes, it and is. Engaging in dialogue and having communication and how you can strengthen your family by the apps, by the presence of a table. Not necessarily a round table, table yeah. but a, a square table like this where the dad or the head of the household yeah. sits at the head of the table and the wife and the children, and you're able to instill and pour into your family what you want them to have. Wow. And these are some of the things that we, we do, do with the clientele or do with those who come to the workshop. We show them and we actually doing this. You're practicing we, it, huh? <laughs> we ain't practicing, we're doing it. Doing it, okay. We're doing practicing. Yeah. Doing this. We even we talk about being diligently, deliberately doing it daily. That's the quad D. Say that again because they go on. deliberately doing it daily. daily. That's quad D. And anything yeah. that you desire for yourself, you don't practice it. Wow. You do it. And wow. it's a much deal. Like, I'm, I'm going to practice lifting this mic. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to do it. Do it and, and lift and, it up. And you yeah. want to make it happen, and you want to just shift in that mindset. Right? So this is for mental health professionals, yes, right? For anyone so they're getting like CEs health. or yeah, CEUs, well, CEs they call them now. Six, six, six ethics hours. Wow, and that's yeah. and that's definitely a good thing in our field for yeah. ethics because, you know, that's very vital. But you've been it's doing this a while, yeah, though, haven't you? school counselors, school social yeah, workers, Yeah, but you've been doing this a while, this workshop, right? Yeah, I started this that's one what I thought. in 2007. Wow. I was denied for a long time. I'm not going to do I'm not going to do continuous. I'm not going to do, 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 do it. And, and it's time. It's time to it's do time. it. So we're going to make that happen and continue with it and share and share. And but you got to do some of it online so people can see it too. But this is, it's a, because I do in Oh, home, because it's, it's hands-on. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's, it's interactive. It's interactive. And That's you right. Know, you want to be able to yeah. touch people and, yeah. and the participants are going to connect and then they're going to, it gets emotional for some, yeah. some of the things that we're going to talk about and I talk about a whole bunch of stuff. So they can register yeah. on your website. Remember, yes, what's your website? Because look at yeah. him the advertising. He getting me to be wearing my stuff too because because I think it's wonderful. Com. Yeah, you can register on my website, the SutherlandCenter dot com. Dot com. to seeing you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's going to be an awesome, 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 awesome thing. All right, and so so as we you know as we further the conversation before we close, I do you know I do want to um, you know where do you think we're headed because you know. <laughs> Social media, and 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 of course we get involved in other people's lives. Like we don't see ourselves in other people's lives, and all of those type of things. Um, what do you say about what's going on with all of these? You know, the R. Kelly situation, and all of these different things. What do, what's your thoughts about that? You know, I mean, just about all this other things that are coming out on about people and, and, and you know, that are, I like the word struggle or having challenges and things like that. What do you say about that? What's your thoughts? I know, you, look, look, I'm, I, I'm catching you know, him off guard, you, you know, all. I'm, yep, I'm catching him off guard today. We'll see what he got to say. <laughs> what's your specific question? Well, just about, you know, what's going on because people do get involved in social media. And, of course, you've been a guest on on a, uh, a reality shows. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, what is your take on that? What are you seeing and, and what's your experience? You know, right. because that's, that's where a lot of people's values are coming from yeah. and their pulse is on it. They follow what NeNe Leakes is doing and what everybody else is doing. I mean, and they kind of live their lives in some way through there. I mean, and that does affect the work that we do. Yeah. So what's your take on that? What do you see? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people like to move with the crowd and do what everybody say we mm -hmm. want to be unique and do your own thing but everybody all right let's use a lot of people yes are engaged in social media and it's a barrier mm. and, and from my perspective the closer you can get to the human to human mm -hmm. interaction with my supervisees and those that will come to my workshop we talk about in this work that we do it's one human being sitting in front of another human wow. being and you want to give them skills for everyday living 
everyday living. So you're saying it's we're not texting being. during that okay, time. Let me tell you, it's <laughs> one human being sitting in front of another human being, mm-hmm. and we want to engage. Yeah, You want to minimize the barriers. A lot of times, and, and, and I think it's Natasha Matthews did a whole workshop on boundaries. Yes. A lot of times there are barriers that are placed between the people which create a disconnect. Yes. And rarely are people just sitting down mm-hmm. face-to-face just talking. having a conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of what we do is we're reteaching how to communicate effectively, yeah. how to listen actively, how to be to clarify what someone else is saying. Yeah. And people are just, hey, let me just take this tea. They're sitting at the dinner table. No, we put all, when we're talking about at the table, all these put go- all electronics away mm-hmm. and you engage wow. and reconnect to each other. It's what's going to create sustainability and longevity. Wow. And, and as people can do this social media. I don't have an issue with it. Mm-hmm. But you still want to have some time where you're connecting with the significant people in your life. Yes. It's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your turtle, your goldfish, yeah. whoever those people are, you still need some face-to-face interaction where Got you. you still need to give a handshake. People need to give a hug for mm. 31 straight seconds every single day, wow. multiple times a day. It needs to be a 31-second hug. Oh my you goodness. need to feel the embrace yes. of the people who love and care about you. You're not getting a hug through social media. No. No matter how many <laughs> hug emojis. How many likes you up, get. <laughs> all that, you still need to feel that touch mm. of a human being. It's still one human being sitting in front of another human being. Oh, my and goodness. that's where you can still do social media, but you still need for, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of mm-hmm. needs, needs yeah. and belonging, you still need the human interaction. Exactly. Some people just do it by go getting a massage. I need a physical touch, but yeah. I don't want nobody to touch me. Uh-huh. And that's cool. Yeah. But the people who love and care about you, you need some time with them because they may need a hug. Exactly. You may not feel, I'm good, but they need a hug. Yeah. You reach out instead of texting somebody. You give them a call sometime and hear their voice, they hear your voice. Yes. And you meet up at a spot and y'all greet and embrace and, and you get a chance to listen to yes. each other. You yes. Get, hey, brother, I got you. Yes. I'm with you, man. Yes. And that means empathy, a whole lot. Is, is, is huge. Yes. And some people, you don't get empathy as yeah. much through social media. Yeah. And and so, you know, and I'm, and I'm in 100% agreement with what you're saying because I think we got to slow down and really get back to that conversation piece, as you're saying, sitting down, interacting, and talking. Because even with the married couples that come in to my practice, you know, when they do come in or they come in for therapy, period, they're able to sit and talk and hear each other. Because a lot of times it's so much going on that they're never sitting down. A lot of times they are they are texting everything right. or they are emailing everything. Like if they have a disagreement, they're emailing okay, I had a problem with this agreement, you know, and I have a problem with what you said, but they're not able to sit down and, as you said, face-to-face and talk and share. And then even as they're in therapy, they then learning more about each other because that they, some people have been married 20, 30 years, they still don't know who that person is. They don't know is. each other's favorite color. No. What you like. No. Fun. And the kids don't even oh, know no. them. What's your mom's birthday? They what's have no mom, clue what's your favorite mom. color. What They don't even know your story, right. you know, of what you've really been through, that you didn't always live with, you know, in that house on the hill. You didn't always have those cars and, right. and you know, was and could afford to travel and things like that. So I think that that's what we're saying today on this show. We're saying, you know, to, you know, we got to sit down and have conversation. And I think that table is so important. And then a lot of times in the theological com- the theological community, we talk about the table being the communion table, mm-hmm. that everybody's invited to the table, everybody has a seat at the table. And Every, yes, and everybody's yeah. able to fellowship mm-hmm. and share and, you know, and is, 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 and is accepted mm-hmm. at the table. And I think that those things are very vital when we do it. So I like that right. table. food relaxes people. There you go. Rarely do you And do. fellowship. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> in a whole different mindset. Yeah. To be more open to what someone else has got to say. Yeah. And I think that you, you know, and I also think that that helps us to develop those intra and interpersonal skills that that you you know that we just have kind of lo- you know in some ways lost through social media through technology you know because at one time we didn't have a cell phone we right. couldn't you know call and text as much but we had yeah. to sit down and have a meeting right. now we do a virtual meeting and you know cool. it's it's good. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I use it now, yeah. but I'm I'm saying if we're really going to deal with some real issues sometimes, we do need to sit down and be hands-on, and that's where I think is important. And I think that that's possibly why we are missing, you know, having challenges with our children is that we're not sitting down, talking to them, explaining things to them, and that dinner, you know, that evening dinner or even breakfast. Some people do it, you know, for breakfast. Yeah. They get up early or they'll, you know, make sure. Because, I mean, because I remember my aunt made it. She instilled in me, just the two of us, we had to sit down. I was like, no, I want to go play. I want to eat in the living room. She said, uh-uh. You're going to sit down here and you're going to eat and you're going to talk and you're going to share. Right. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do you, that. Yeah, you're speaking of what we call <laughs> family time. From yes. Four, family time from four to nine. Mm. That's the typical hours from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. where family really can engage and connect. Yeah. You spent hours at work, and they spent hours in school mm -hmm. while working for the children, and now the family time from 4 to 9 is the time where you get to put in whatever you want to put exactly. into your family. You're gonna, whether you sit down at the table and eat dinner, mm -hmm. or y'all engaging in a card game, playing Uno, Goldfish, Bidwiz, whatever you want to play, yes. it's the time to engage. And if those four to nine, that five hour block mm. is getting decreased, decreased, yes, decreased. It is. And then after a while, y'all don't even have any time because extracurricular activities go to seven to eight o'clock. And then y'all guys do homework and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Kids don't have to participate in extracurricular activities every semester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can take a semester off or take a season off. Because uh -oh. if your children are engaging in more social activities than they are in your home and in whatever you want to mm -hmm. put into, to me that's a disconnect. Yeah. Because now they're going from baseball to football to track to basketball to baseball, football track, or yeah. soccer or dance or wrestling or whatever they're exactly. doing. Exactly. And now you're the way you guys are engaging is y'all are driving in the car, hey how was your day? Your day is all right, and you yeah. toss some food in the back as y'all go through the drive. -thru. McDonald's. And then you had another chance to sit down and say, you know, hey, I hadn't seen yeah. you all day Yeah, long. checking in. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know you changed your hair because mm -hmm. you hadn't seen each other. Checking in. As often as you can to sit down wow. together to listen to each other. Yes. Repetition is big. Every Nobody learned the alphabet, from my understanding, mm -hmm. the first time. There's 26 letters, 52 if you count upper and lower case. Wow. And everything mm. is through repetition, and you're going to repeat. Yes. Like, you need to talk to your kids about sex, drugs, alcohol, this new Momo thing that is out for the kids. Yes. That's scaring kids mm -hmm. now. That's a hoax. And you got to have time to talk to your children. Yeah, and explain you to them. just put them on YouTube, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, even, or even television. With, even with parental controls, you still can't control. Yeah. It's no control. Yeah. You can give them a book to read, or y'all can do a reading in a book together, play Monopoly. Yeah. My bad, my bad. Y'all call it Monopoly. <laughs> I don't know what Yeah, y'all call it Monopoly. <laughs> okay. But it's still about time together. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're saying today on a therapeutic conversation. We're just talking about, and I just really hear, if you didn't get anything else, I'm really hearing that we got to connect. And I think it's something spiritual about it, too, that we're connecting to the human spirit. Correct. You know what I'm saying? And we're really engaging because beyond all of this technology that we have and all the things that we have, we are human you know, we have a human spirit, you know, and I think, and I, and on this show, we talk about mind, body, and spirit, right. and I mean, and you really are, you know, we really have to, you know, and maybe that's the hope, you know, that's where, you know, the hope is, is that everything that, a, a lot of things distract us from that one-on-one, -on -one mm -hmm. or that group setting where we're sharing, where we're putting things out, and that also goes back to um, a clinical pastor education, a CPE uh, training that I do, that the ministers and, and leaders sit down, and they talk about their ministry, they talk about their history, they talk about certain things that are involved in ministry, they also present what we call clinical cases, the same way we do in supervision, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, presenting um, ministry encounters is, is what we call it, you know, where we're sharing and we're talking and we're analyzing too, but also giving some feedback on like why you did this or, you know, the sermon you preach, what was that really all about? Was that really, you know, effective? Was that really your stuff? Right. You know, where does our stuff interact in what God has called us to do? So that's very vital too. So, you know, very important. So that's what we've been talking about on the show. And we have kind of dispelled some of the myths about African-American males not getting in therapy, but we do see you an increase. More. You can always use more. Yeah, but we see an increase though, and there's hope, you know, and that's what we want to always put out there is that we don't have to wait till there's a crisis to get 
um, to get checkups, right. to check in. Even with some of my clients I've had for years, they'll check in once a month. They'll check in, you know, once every so often just to come in and just talk and share. And it's always a great benefit at that time to be able to do that. So that's very vital. And so we definitely want to put that out there. We definitely want to, I definitely want you to reach out to Dr. Sutherland um, at the Sutherland Center, www.sutherland. Is that right? The, the, the Sutherland. Sutherland Center. Dot com. So reach out to him. Definitely, he is definitely um, able and educated and licensed to be able to, to provide those needs, uh, workshops and also one-on-one -on -one counseling and things like that, especially if you're in the metro area. He hasn't taken the show to the nation yet, but I know it's <laughs> his work, his work to the nation yet, but I know it's coming. <laughs> but anyway, I just, you know, I just have to commend you for all your work and, um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with work in the trenches sometime. And I mean, because somebody got to be there oh, yeah. to, to do that. Everybody, you know, you know, it's talking about what should be done because, and I do want to close with this part. A lot of times people, you know, when you say, and I don't know about, you know, whether this is your experience, but when you say that, hey, you know, I'm in the mental health world or the field, they'll say, oh, that's so needed. But then nobody really says anything after that, you know, says nothing about getting trained, you know, and, and even in, in, uh, in the church, it's talking about go get therapy, call Jesus and call a therapist. But it's like, people not talking about getting trained because there are things that everybody can do to make life better. Right. And even what you're talking about, that interaction can make life better. You don't have to be licensed to be able to sit and listen to someone's story and support them and affirm or to be at the table, as you right. said, to love on someone, accept someone, support someone, even pray for somebody. I know we don't do that a lot of times anymore, but you know we need to yep. be praying for people and supporting one another and Tell them, telling them that they're loved. They're loved by God, and I love you, you know, with the love of God. And I think that those things are very vital that we continue to put those things out and really, but that connection, if you don't get anything else, as I said, that connection is so vital that we are really focusing on connecting with one another. We're mind, we're body, and we're spirit, and we want to definitely continue to make that connection and do that. So awesome work that you're doing. Awesome work. I mean, I, I love it. I just want to give a few announcements before we close. Um, definitely CPE is going on, clinical pastoral education, um, and definitely we're pushing that. Um, we definitely going to start one, you know, start one today. We're going to start other groups. So if you are interested in clinical pastoral education out there, we definitely are available. You can definitely reach me at www.joshua-generation.net. That's www.joshua-generation.net. We also are having Mental Health First Aid USA, which is very vital. It's a, it gives you the tools to be able to deal with, your, with mental health and become what we call a mental health first aider, you know, just to recognize those signs and, and get that education that you need. And then the last thing is, is going to be our conference, um, the State of the African American Church and Mental Health. And it's going to be June 28th through the 29th um, in Marietta, Georgia at the Hilton Conference Center there. And we will be talking about all kinds of things, assessing, you know, where we are in our churches and also in the community and, and addressing those things and also coming up with a, an assessment, but then an action plan about what we're going to do. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm really trying to form a network of therapists like yourself, like me, that have a spiritual connection that understands that and able to provide that for the community and for these churches. Because there's a lot of a lot of work we're missing out. People still, you know, come into church, but they're not getting the mental health needs or at least getting connected to people that understand their theology and also multicultural competencies. That means they, you know, people that look like you can understand you, can relate to you, those type of things. And so those, that's vital, you know, vitally important in connecting those things. So we just want to put all of that out there make sure that you are aware of all of those things. And so definitely reach out, please like our Facebook Facebook page, there'll be the conversation show. You can also like the Joshua Generation Care and Consultant Service Facebook page. Please send a message. And today I do want to thank uh, Rob Jerome is watching, Elgin Team Dudley is watching. Um, and so shouts out to you and Sherry Taylor for watching. I mean, you all are the only ones that put comments, but I know the numbers are still out there and people are still watching. But if you are watching, I want you to say that you're watching. Send us an email. Um, definitely you can call 
you know, in. But, I mean, definitely reach out to us, and we just thank you for everything and all the support that you give every week that we're here and been doing it. And also thanks to 108 Praise Radio for this platform, uh, Courtney and the staff, because we are voicing the gospel, the good news of, of Jesus, but the good news of God, that God loves you and God cares for you, and vitally important in making us those connections, then God has called us to make those connections with each other and to take some time to listen right. and to support and love on people. Because, you know, imagine if someone is, as we close, someone is committing, you know, has suicidal thoughts, right. suicidal ideation, and someone comes up to them and and just show them love and support and listen to them and say, what's really going on? Can we, you know, you got some options here. You don't have to take that route. Imagine the lives that we could change if we make that connection. So as I said, if you didn't get anything else today, get that. Let's make a connection. Let's be intentional about making a connection with people and loving on people and showing people and meeting people where they are and helping that thing. So what's your final thoughts that you want to say to the audience before we close? We get ready to close in two minutes. <laughs> hey, for the significant people that are in your life, Give them a call as often as you can to say hello to them, to check on them. For the people who are close to you that's significant in your life, as often as you can, give them a hug for at yes. least 31 seconds, at least, at least three times a day. Embrace them, and they will feel that warmth of your touch. They'll feel that warmth of your embrace for a long time, and they will remember that. And as often as you can, stay connected into the lives of all those significant people, whether it's your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, your nieces, your nephews, your mm. frat brothers, sorority <laughs> sisters. I mean, your congregation yes. at your church. Just reach out and embrace them and give a chance to listen to them and connect with them. The connection is the greatest part that we could have. When you think of connection, it, it begins with C-O. And a lot of words that begin mm. with C-O is about together. So whether you're connecting, you're communicating, you're collaborating, it's together. And we're supposed to be together. Yes. When we feel that touch of someone else's hand and we feel the word of someone else listening to us. So connect. Yes. Thank you so much. Well said. Wonderful show today. And we have definitely have, have definitely talked about some things. So thank you again. for, And definitely you have to come back some time and share. So I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that you're doing. And you all have a wonderful week. I'll see you again here on 108 Praise Radio. This is the Therapeutic Conversation Show. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Jones, LPC. In the house every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. You can also reach us on the website, www.joshua-generation.net. And please like our Facebook page, Therapeutic Conversation Show. All right, have a wonderful week. Make that connection. Reach out. And just show people you love them and listen to this story. Have a wonderful week. Thanks again for your time. See y'all later. months and uh, we happened to meet on the internet by the way you know at first you know I was like mm, I don't know maybe he's from Chicago he might be a <laughs> slick <laughs> and we got to talking and um, I realized he was a man of integrity this is the best age ever <laughs> because you've been through some experiences and you know some things that you didn't understand earlier in life. You can appreciate it, I think, now that um, 
uh, that you can look back on certain things. You know, true passion is grown out of understanding and knowing someone. The power of our love is, is integrity and honesty. We just tell each other the truth, even when we don't. Agree. Th yeah, exactly. <laughs> we agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> I love for you is? What? Genuine <laughs> and, and real. My love for you is complete. <laughs> We've been married about 15 months. And uh, we happened to meet on the internet, by the way. You know, at first, you know, I was like, mm, 